All right. Um, once again, thank you for coming. And uh, my name is Karam Bode Sadiq. I'm the director of the UWA Institute of Agriculture. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the University of Western Australia situated on Noongar land. The Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodian of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. Uh, before we begin, I would like to invite you to join us for the light refreshments and drinks at the networking sundowner following this lecture. It will be at the Baileys. Yep, it will be at the Baileys. We will just walk across. There are signs and members of the IOA staff will help, happily help to direct you. There are a number of familiar faces um, and, um, in the, uh, today uh, from CSARO, DEPERD, and beyond because uh, Santol has been known to many of you. So thank you again for coming. But I would like to acknowledge uh, our former Director General of the uh, Department of Agriculture, Dr. Graham Robertson here. Um, then we have Forest Research Foundation Director, Professor James Aravani Takis. I don't know whether he's here. He has registered. Emeritus Professor Hans Lambers, uh, Graham Martin, uh, and Stephen Pals. Some of them may come later. And there are a number of other colleagues here. So once again, I welcome you all on behalf of the university for this special lecture we are holding today. Now, um, Professor Sendol Asing, Asing is the right pronunciation, uh, is a professor of digital agriculture and the director of the World Agricultural Systems Center at the Technical University, Munich, Germany. Of course, we all know that uh, he has worked uh, more than 16 years at CSARO and at least uh, 10 years at the University of Florida before moving back to uh, Germany. So he has got a lot of work in cropping system, simulation modeling, and is a top 1% highly cited researcher by Web of Science 2022. He's a member of the Scientific Committee of Agricultural Model in the Comparison and Involvement Improvement Project and a co-leader of the Ag MIP Wheat, I think which he will tell later on. Um, Senthold uh, received his degrees and PhD from Humboldt University in Berlin and Habilitation and Technical University Munich. He worked at CSIR, as I mentioned, for 16 years, and that's where quite a lot of the basic work in relation to dryland agriculture, modeling, climate change, and, and other work has been done. And of course, Sandol has been uh, intimately associated with the UWA. He was an adjunct professor here when he left to um, Florida. Uh, in the lecture today, he will explore the global challenge for food production and role of new technologies, because we heard a lot about the climate change, climate change adaptation, mitigation. What can new technology do in order to um, adapt? Okay. So I would like to thank uh, Santol for coming today and giving us uh, this lecture, but he also met with uh, some of our colleagues uh, for an hour, uh, various discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric, for the very kind words. First, I thought I'd do something else. I wanted to actually say thanks to someone who has been a great mentor to me, a teacher, and a really great friend. And he really got me into enjoying writing papers, which you need, which is Neil Turner, who actually has his birthday today. So happy birthday, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> So with that, now we can go to the drinks. Oh, I tell you a bit. So I, my talk will be about, I have three different parts to it. The first one, I will rush you a bit through. There are actually a bit more things on there, but if I don't do it, it's not clear why I, the way I will finish. So I will go you through some, take you through some trends, through some numbers, things happening, which are related, obviously, to agriculture. Um, then I want to show you a bit of how we use the modeling, because that's what we did a lot here. And then I'll show you something which some of my colleagues call me crazy about, or being crazy, and I want to see how you react. So I might come a bit in front, but if it gets too heavy, I might also sort of hide behind the bench. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, let's get in there. Um, so I want to start with a slide, which I think many of you have seen, but I think it's very important to remember 
that not long ago, 200 years ago, there were about a, mil a billion people on, on Earth, and most of them actually uh, suffered hunger at some parts during their life or during certain parts of the season, and, and, and the agriculture supplied for a very small proportion only food for them. And this went on for at least another 100 years, maybe 150 years. If you think about uh, 1950, we still had this increase in, in uh, population there. Uh, we reached by, by uh, maybe let's say, after 100 years, uh, a doubled in population. But we also had an increase in the people which had enough to eat or not, not enough to eat. So um, we usually had, uh, the normal thing was that most people on this earth had hunger. And then it kept going and suddenly in the 50s, 60s, we got this huge increase in, in population. And you probably remember in mid of uh, November, the eight billion person was born. So we had eight billion people now. And something, something really interesting happened. Uh, we saw a bit of increase in poverty, but then things changed. And uh, you can see, I put some pictures in there. Along the way, there was quite a bit of uh, 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 technology coming in. Uh, the tractor replaced the horse around uh, 120 years ago. Uh, but this big thing came through um, industrialization of, of um, agriculture, which you are now bringing pesticides in the fertilizer to feed the, the plants, breeding. Uh, the tractors got bigger and bigger, uh, but we really, we or the agriculture community, we have shifted something. Our agriculture really did something which probably wasn't clear before. It, it brought even this number down. And right now, um, agriculture feeds um, almost a bit more than, than 7 billion, and it could probably even do more. Uh, I come to this uh, to a point. There's another reason why we have this. But um, in a way, it's a very positive story. Uh, agriculture did something that, that lots of people are not hungry anymore. There's still a lot of them, 800 million is still a lot, but it's a huge achievement for agriculture. So I want to start with a positive side, with a positive note on this. Um, population, it's actually not really clear where it goes. I heard no more recent uh, projections. We might sort of peak uh, in the 60, 2060, 2070, we probably go about uh, 9 billion. We might actually get to 10 billion. But I think there are good signs that we're not, we're not on this sort of uh, highest projection from, from the UN. So population growth will go on. Um, it's still sort of on a, on a quite a steep, steep curve. Uh, at the same time, we have seen that um, the numbers of farmers declined. And, and you, you know that from, uh, from Australia, I just heard. When I actually left there, there 6,000, so 13 years ago, 6,000 grain farmers here. I just had the number a bit over 4,000, so the numbers still go down. It's something which happened actually everywhere in the world, in all of the developing um, countries, in all the developed countries, it's actually very low level, but even in the developing world, the numbers go down. You're just on a very different, different point. In Africa, for instance, you still have 50% of the people working there. In most, um, Western countries here down to less than, less than 2%. These are numbers from the US, and that was the only one I could find from, from 200 years ago, where basically 200 years ago, almost everyone worked in agriculture. The population has increased. Um, by now, it's, it's maybe 2 million people working there, probably less by now. Uh, so the numbers really declined. If you put a line through there, you could think, well, there won't be any, anyone working in agriculture anymore. And I put the numbers out for, for Germany, uh, I think it's very similar for, for Australia. And of, as a consequence, and you can see that here as anywhere else, uh, the fields become um, um, uh, much larger. You have less farmers doing much more, becoming more efficient. efficient. So it's part of the being able actually to feed. This was part of the process with all the con other consequences are, uh, related to that as well. I mentioned before, yes, there are still more than 800 million people hungry. That's still a huge number. It often relates to production, but there's often something else to it as well. We actually do produce enough for everyone right now, but it's often a conflict with a neighboring country. First, it's a very poor country, then you have a conflict, or you have a civil war, then you have a drought, and then within a few months, you're up to seven million people uh, suffering hunger. So this is a more recent map of undernourished people. You can see, uh, oops, uh, the area in here. 
uh, Africa, um, uh, many countries of Africa, that still have a very high proportion of undernourished people in there. Um, but as I said before, we do actually produce plenty. We actually produce much more than we need at the moment. It could even, it's enough for at least for another billion people there. When you sort of consider all the production which gets actually thrown away. It's actually one third of all the produced food is thrown away. And there are reasons of where it goes. I said before, I actually want to rush through this a bit uh, because I want to, I want you to help understanding why I do what I do now. Uh, so we lose a lot of production. Um, we have a problem across the world in almost every country with obesity, that we eat too much. Uh, and it's basically waste, and it's a health issue as well on top of it. Um, we actually produce a lot, or use a lot of the agricultural land to produce feed, uh, to feed the animals. And we know that, it in, in depends on where you are, that's why there's a comment in here, um, it doesn't have to be that, but in general you need uh, seven kilograms of cereals to produce one kilogram of beef, so it's very inefficient. Um, and, but we all have a habit, and I come back to this, of, of lighting and eating lots, lots of um, animals. And animals do have, so don't get me wrong, they have a place in the system, they often have a very important place in the agriculture system, for eating, for, uh, for, for digesting things you can't use otherwise, uh, using byproducts, using areas which you can't get with, with field production. And it actually has quite a few healthy things in there as well. It's actually a healthy food if you eat it in uh, certain limits. Um, there's still also a huge potential if you really want to produce, uh, produce more. Um, in many parts of the world, we are not at the potential in terms of the attainable yield, if you don't have irrigation, there's still parts of the world where irrigation is put into a place where you could get to the potential yield. So even there uh, would be a potential to increase it further. Coming to the irrigation one, um, what we do already, and that's, um, I really want to think about, you, about these numbers, we um, use an agriculture on the global basis. It's not maybe definitely not in WA so much and in, in, in Australia so much, but on a global base, we use we are using two thirds of all the freshwater uh, withdrawals for agriculture for irrigation, and two thirds of that is used in four countries in the world, and lots of that goes into seals, into wheat, for instance. So we use a lot of water for that, and uh, normally. That's a sort of an average number. I think in, in, in some years and some farmers in Australia might sort of beat this number for wheat a bit, bit uh, further down there. But on average, it's 1,500 liters of water for uh, every kilogram of wheat. So it's a lot of water use. And if you have to do it through irrigation and you don't have enough water, that's a real big issue. Um, there are other issues to agriculture. Uh, that's an interesting paper here I'd, I'd like to sort of just get your attention to. Again, I want to explain what's going on. It shows you the risk of surface pollution through pesticides. And it's different in different regions and the expansion for it. Some of that has to do with the amounts you put on. Some of it has to do with the terrain and how the rainfall comes down. So again, if you know where the agriculture areas are, and these are most in some colors here, it's a huge issue uh, in most parts of the world. Um, so we really need to reduce, at the same time we need to produce, we probably have to produce more, as I said before, but we, at the same time we have to find a different way of we, how we produce, we need to uh, reduce the uh, uh, environmental impact. And I want to show you some, some pictures from, from Florida where it really comes now to the mind of the society. Um, the Gulf of Mexico receives so many nutrients it's not all agriculture. There are also lots of gardening around, which is this, uh, of golf places around. But nobody really knows how, how it's, sort of, it's divided. But I think a very large proportion comes from agriculture, causing algae blooms now very regularly, uh, leading to fish deaths. Not sure if you can recognize this. They're now closing quite regularly hundreds of kilometers of beaches. People, <coughs> I, might, I might tell you that as well, they think Florida has the best beaches, and I keep telling them, you guys need to come to Australia to see some really beautiful mm -hmm. beaches. But people go there for swimming, and, and there are now several weeks, sometimes months during summer, you cannot go to the beach because it's algae, algae bloom, it took over, 
it stinks, it, it stinks like crazy, I think, uh, but it also produces some fumes, which are actually not, not good for your, for your health. So a huge problem, and, and at least a large part of that is it's very likely related to the way we currently do agriculture. Um, at the same time, there are two mutants which go on, that's nitrogen and, and phosphorus. We know already that the production of phosphorus will peak in the next 10 years, maybe 20 years. So phosphorus is a limited resource, and we throw in it and we're losing it through our agriculture systems, destroying our waterways up to the coastlines and like, at the example, the, the Gulf of Mexico there. So the way we produce and the way we deal with it, it's not sustainable, we can't do it. We can't continue doing this. One more thing in there, in, 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 uh, in particular in Europe, uh, there's a lot of attention now uh, on biodiversity and there's some numbers. I've seen a similar graph where they put Asia and, and Australia together. I couldn't get these kind of sort of calculations for, for Australia, but I think everywhere in the world uh, biodiversity has gone down and the attribute, again, it's not just agriculture, but a large part of this decline of uh, biodiversity is due to agriculture, the way we do agriculture, the way we clear the land for it, but also the way we clean anything, everything out within our, our fields. And we need to find another way to stop this sort of decline in biodiversity, maybe even bring it up, but still be also able to produce food and maybe even more food. So when you summarize these things, uh, you might have seen these, these sort of calculations uh, related to uh, the limits and where we reach the limits of uh, the planetary boundaries uh, and some of them we overreach them already we are at points where things take uh, sort of a life on their own and things getting destroyed so again to, to bring it to, together we need to produce food um, food production is very important agriculture is a very important place we achieved a lot the way we did it but we did at the same time cause a lot of other problems which in the future, we have to find other ways to deal with it. it we can't go on like this on a global scale. Um, part of that is related to what we eat and what we want. And, and I, I, again, don't want to go to too many details. I'll show you some numbers. They also vary, but I think in the Germans eat 60 kilograms of meat. I saw some numbers. I think the Australians are a bit better in there. Maybe the meat is even better. It's too much. It's, I think it's not about stopping it at all. I think, as I told you before, there's some place in there. But the amounts we eat, they are not healthy uh, for society, and they are not healthy for the, for the environment because of the very poor conversion of the, of the energy in there. So, again, I really rush you through there in very simple terms. We need to produce more. There will be more demand. Uh, we need, at the same time, uh, reduce environmental impact. And we need to think about uh, what we produce, the, 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 the quality and the, the nutritional value needs to be increased as well. And many of the things we do in agriculture relate actually to the United Nations developing goals. And we really need to rethink of how we do these things. And on top of it, we have climate change. So we haven't talked about this yet. Um, where we have seen a temperature increase over the last 100 years by globally by one degree per region, because usually the, the land masses uh, heat up faster than the oceans, it's actually more, and the, the way it will change, there will be also differences of, of how it goes. Uh, I think we are at 410 or 415 parts per million now. We probably reach very likely the 500 parts per million in the next, next 30 years. If we keep doing this, the temperature will go globally up by two to four degrees. That means for some parts of the world, it's uh, six to seven degrees or eight degrees. Uh, we will see um, change, so the temperature will go up, we will see changes in drought, there's more uncertainty of how that works. What seems to be sort of coming through is that in some parts it might not get less rainfall, but it comes more concentrated, and therefore we have longer periods of no rain, which sort of creates droughts as well. But what's, what sort of the real challenge is how to understand these extremes we see and I will come to the extreme spec again. So part of my research and, and, and a lot of the things we did here using simulation models, uh, I continued, but we did it, we do it now in a different way with the agriculture model intercomparison improvement project. It's a project which just started in the time when I, when I joined the, uh, when I joined uh, University of Florida in the US. It's a project which started with Cynthia Rosenzweig 
who got the World Food Prize last year, so it got a lot of attention now. It's a project uh, which has now more than 1,000 members worldwide. Uh, for the last five years, I'm part of the executive committee where we meet very regularly with, with eight different uh, colleagues all over the world trying to manage the 1,000 um, uh, members of, uh, of this where we really try to get a better handle in terms of understanding what, what climate change will do to agriculture, to actually start thinking of what can we do about it, how should we adjust to it. Um, within ACMAP, one of the early projects was about wheat, because I did a lot of wheat modeling, and it was a lot of fun sort of bringing the wheat models together. I think we have now almost 90% of all models in the world are part of, of, of the team we have, going on already for, for 13 years now. And what we do is we, we spend a lot of time getting good data. We do blind tests, want to see how models work, uh, do model improvement, but we do also application. And I just want to show you one, one example where we had data from the field, uh, that it's heating in there from Arizona. It gets in summer anyhow so hot that you can't grow anything there. They put additional heaters on there. And you can see in this observed data in here, these are measurements with, with error bars in here. If you sort of keep pushing the system, eventually you can't grow anything anymore. And what we did is we gave the modelers um, only, I think, one point and described what's going on and gave them all the other information they needed to simulate, but they did not know what the outcome was of it. I only show the yields. There was also biomass, leaf area, grain, and all these sort of things were measured. They were also tested. And then we let the models uh, run things. And the first impression is every of these lines is a simulation it's all over, so it's, they don't know anything. You could take it this way. But if you take this gray area in here, oops, if you take the gray area, that's where 50% of the models are. And that's where, when you take the error bars in there, you can't be better than your measurements. So if the measurements are not precise, you can't be much better. 50% um, of the models were within this gray area. If you take the median, you almost go through all of these uh, uh, mean, mean observed data. And we realized, in actually a previous paper is actually sort of a confirmation of this, if you use many models together, you, and, and, and across many data sets, you have a better projection with your model. So you're much better taking more than one model than just saying, oh, my model is best, and I take it. Um, you have another lecture, it takes another hour, so I could show you that it really can fail, where you think it works in some locations, others it totally, it totally fails. Um, so we're doing, we're doing a lot of this. We, we're working with lots of experimentalists. We're getting really fantastic data. Um, but we also want to use them, want to get a feeling for what's happened with climate change. And knowing that if you take a multi-model ensemble, you get, a better, uh, you get a better result, we have a much more powerful way now to think, to think about what's happening with the future. Uh, here's one example where we looked at um, as a high rainfall an irrigated area worldwide, which, worldwide, which sort of cover about 70% of the wheat production. Um, we, we wanted to have Australian locations in there. You could see where we, where we went there in, in, in higher rainfall or where they did a little bit of irrigation there in the, in the east. And we, we did simulations for 30 years in there with 30 models. Um, and in this particular play, it's situation, we just increase the temperature by a few degrees and want to see what's going on. And what I chose in there, you get very different uh, results depending of, of where you are. If you are in a very hot environment, it's not much wheat produced, but they produce in, in Sudan some, another degree or two really brings their yields down. There's some in average which you might have very little change, um, but, um, but when you sort of scale these things uh, up what we could show, and, and we did get a lot of attention for this, we could, sorry, we could actually show on a global basis, if you scale it up to global production, that each degree temperature <coughs> increase will reduce your yields by 6%. So if we come back to the two or maybe four degrees, it adds up to a lot. You might not see it this way because there's more than temperature going on. And I come to this in a moment. Um, when we looked at the results, and this is at the global scale, we could see that the grain yield reduction, this is due to the uh, one degree. Uh, you can see in here there's a lot of variation around there. But when you see this, uh, the main cause of this is less grains, because you shorten your phenology. 
It's not the it's not the grain filling. So we were thinking if that's global, that's have that, that's what's happening at the global level. But if you take all of them into account, the so one way to counter this was to bring your phonology back again, knowing that you move into higher temperature because most of the wheat in the world grows into the summer, into the heat. Um, we did it anyhow, but we wanted to see does it actually exist. So these are observed data. And by the time we started working with lots of experimentalists and said, do you have data where you grow different cultivars in different time temperature environments? We found four different data sets where the colleagues, which did all these measurements, never looked at it in this way. So we looked for uh, cultivar pairs, which differed in a way that one of them uh, flowered two weeks later and had a higher grain filling rate. So if you flower later and you, you push your, your system into the heat, you also need to fill your grains uh, higher. And in all of the four environments, one of them like the Nile Delta, it's a nice temperature gradient, everything is sort of irrigated, well fertilized. Uh, you go from the south to the north, it's a four degree difference. There was one data set where they had, I think, 120 different cultivars in there, uh, from Florida up to the, to the north. And in each of them, we found examples where the cultivar which had um, two weeks later flowering and a higher grain filling rate did better in a warmer environment. In the cooler environment, you didn't see anything. So we knew it does exist. We knew it does exist in the world, in the world out there, in real cultivars, sometimes in, in lines. And then we said, let's do this experiment with the models now across all these locations. And we did, and we extend the locations now also to low rainfall regions, so we have now six locations. There are a lot of information in there. It's about grain yield and protein. We did a lot of protein. I know some of you are really interested in that. Let's park the protein for the beer we have afterwards. Let's just look at the left, hand, less left part of these little balls, which is the yield. And you're probably interested in trying to see what's going on in, in, um, in Western Australia. I think the lower one is still the Cochinot part, but we ended at a, a, a dry location. I think it's Meriden in there. And you can see the climate change itself in the south having now um, a climate scenario in there. So it's not just the temperature anymore. It's also the rainfall that might change. And we're getting CO2, which helps you particularly under dry situation. You get more you have higher water use efficiency in there. You can see based on this that based on the 30 models, the average of the 30 models, um, you will have a decline in yield. Um, sorry, I should sorry. You get a decline in yield in Maryland, but not in, in Cochinup down there. Uh, um, and, and you get all sorts of different combinations around. If you then put this trait in there, so every of these 30 models had to find a way to deal with this trait. If you put on top of the climate change this trait combination in there, which we now ex does exist, uh, you can see that um, it doesn't help in Maryland. It's not good to extend your flowering under climate change. You might nodding, so we are right there, obviously. Um, but it really helps in the, in the wetter part. And you can see it depends really where you are. It really depends on what sort of environment you have. When you put it all together, and we can, I haven't said anything how we aggregate, but I can, we can talk about aggregation as well. And we have a lot of confidence the way we aggregate that it, it makes sense on a global level because we were able to compare it with other ways of aggregations and we come to very similar results. When you put it all together, so this is again global number, uh, when you look here at the right one, this is the climate change scenario I showed you. In average with climate change globally, you get a small increase in, in yield. Um, if you um, put to the baseline these traits, nothing really happens. If you put to the climate change scenarios, and usually behind there, there are five scenarios, again, 30 years, uh, 30 models, so a lot of, lot of calculations behind there you get a 60% increase. So it shows on the global level, it makes quite a large difference, knowing from what I just showed you before, it, but it really depends on how much you get where. And there will be areas where it actually will, have, will be negative systems. But if you do it on all of them globally, you have a positive impact. The other part in here is sort of a sensitivity analysis, just for interest maybe. If you increase the temperature, yields go down, what I showed you before. If you put CO2 in there, uh, just CO2 on the baseline, you get a big boost globally and, and you bring it back again with your temperature. So the way we simulate and the way we think we understand that 
um, that most of the negative effects from temperature might be sort of leveled out with the, with the CO2, might be leveled out. Um, but we started looking at, at extremes, and we had a lot of data in, in Brazil, working with, with I have a student from Brazil. He was able to get from close to 1,000 districts for 20 years um, in Brazil, wheat producing areas, uh, data where we used um, statistical models because we knew there's diseases going on, frost going on, things we could not do with our models. Um, we had the new CIMIT, uh, 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 the new um, uh, CMP6 uh, data set, which is sort of the, the most recent um, uh, climate data sets which actually start in 1850 and going through. So we built first the model with this data. We trained this on, the da on this data. We used different uh, statistical model. Um, uh, some of them you probably would call a machine learning uh, um, uh, a system. And, what you, and, and this is the application of it running several of these scenarios. What you can see in here is that for up to 2000, 2020, you get viability in there. We quantified uh, the 1 in 20 lowest yields as the most extreme yields. You get it once in 20 years. There could be a period of 30, 40 years not having it. But when you then keep the same data sets moving on with the same model, what you see in there, you actually uh, end up with, by the end of the century, uh, probably have to deal with the extremes. The extremes become the norm. What I try to tell you in here is that the way we've done the modeling by using uh, the, uh, the previous sort of climate scenarios, by not having all the components in there, like diseases which, which pop up, uh, by having other things in there which the models down here, we might not capture the effects of climate change, right? Which this is showing, uh, it might be actually looking very different when you try to deal with extremes. And we have seen extremes uh, around the world. One of them we're working at the moment, you might know about in France in 2016, a very steady producing uh, country. If the yields vary uh, at, at the national scale by 5%, it's a lot. In 2016, the yields dropped by 30% there. And in the end, most of these things you could trace back to climate change trends in there. But some of them came through uh, heavy rainfall, not enough light, heavy rainfall, and very moist environment, getting diseases in there which they didn't recognize. So there are things happening there already, which uh, scenarios like this might be more likely than the ones where we think, oh, globally, much, so much might not change. So I wanted to give you the other picture where we're not really sure what's going on that, that uh, uh, extremes might be sort of the, the hidden card or the sort of thing where we don't really know how to deal with yet. Um, okay, let me move now to the things which I better just move behind here in case you throw things at me. Um, alternative food production uh, methods. We had a great workshop just before I left uh, Florida where we talk, talked about different ways of uh, food production. Uh, just on this, I could probably talk a lot on the different ways. I just want to pick one, which is indoor food production. And I want to show you what indoor wheat might know. Anyone getting off their seats? Eh? Um, and most of these things relate to circular um, um, uh, economy, of, sort of recycling things. If you want to know more about it, so we wrote a paper about it. But today, I just want to quickly talk about, about uh, wheat just to show you what the potential might be of this. So when you talk about the field, you, you sort of have very little control. There's some control. I mean, you decide when you plant, uh, you decide where you sow things. So there's a little control, but most of the things you're just exposed to light, weather, and soil. In a glass house, you might not have a soil at all. You might actually have some additional light in there. So uh, you might have a bit of control. You, you could start earlier because you, it's a bit warmer. Uh, but there's now a new thing which started about a decade ago, maybe a bit more. It's called indoor farming, where you control everything. And there's nothing in from the outside. There's no sun coming in there because you grow stuff on different levels. Uh, this really has taken off. Just the last year with the energy prices, they got sort of a pushback there. So uh, some of these companies really struggle. But in all of them, and that's the point I want to make in here, it's not about the, the single uh, plants anymore, it's about crops. So you don't, we're not talking about a pot plant in there. If you want to move to production, it's all about larger areas. We talk about, about crop scale. So there's a lot of stuff going on. 
Um, you, can, you can buy a, a fridge like this and, and have your herbs uh, coming out uh, every day freshly if you want, fully controlled with your phone. Uh, there are now some shops in, in Germany you go in and you, you harvest your own, your own lettuce here. There. Um, there are these sort of container systems that are quite, quite popular. I've been last year in, in, uh, to Calera. It's a huge uh, warehouse, uh, 13 layers up here. Uh, in farm, uh, they are based in Berlin. They have another 10 locations across the world. They grew in 10 years from three guys which wanted to do it to more than 1,000 employers. They had to kick out 500 uh, during the, the energy crisis, so things are going but up and down. That's a, that's a box which has about 10 by 10 meters, 12 meters high. There are 32 layers of crops in there. And you don't go in there, everywhere in there to have a look in there, everything is automatic. So things, you put things in from the side, they go in there, they're moved around, they're watered, they get their light, everything gets controlled, and they come out uh, when you need it. And there are all sorts of other, other systems, I think, I'm not sure if they, these guys survive, they actually grow things on the side. That's one where you, where you move plants around and you don't even have a water solution, you use aeroponics, where you spray the water and the nutrients to it. Uh, uh, so there are all sorts of things uh, currently tried out. Um, we're doing wheat and soybean now indoor, we're trying that. Uh, so we have done now quite a few experiments with wheat. Uh, the reason I actually could come here was we, have a, we got quite a bit of money from Singapore government doing uh, soybean in, in, in Singapore. Um, for wheat, we did a lot of calculation, uh, just to give you the sort of the potential what's, 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 what, what you can actually do if you go indoor and control everything. They try to give the plant everything they, they want. If you think about the world average, uh, 3.4 tons, I understand you're getting this year 2.8 um, with your, your third bumper, bumper crop here. The highest yield, the one in here is actually from New Zealand. I just saw there's something else, another ton, I think 17 or 18 tons in the field in, in England. Um, the, the highest uh, country yield is actually uh, around 10 tons per hectare is, is Ireland. The, uh, experiments they did in NASA because they were starting thinking about going to, the, to Mars and going on missions where they can't come back in the 80s. They spent years on breeding. That's the only um, one of the few crops which have ever been bred for indoor is actually stuff which goes to, which is not vegetables, it's, it's wheat. They, have, they produce three wheat cultivars. The pictures you saw before, we got the seeds. That's a wheat which only gets 50 centimeter high. That's a double dwarf gene in there. Because when you talk indoor, think indoor, it's not just the area. You think actually it's a, it's a yield per volume. So you want to be as short as possible. Um, so they had experiments there where the wheat grows for 70 days. So you get about 13, 14 tons, but you get five, five harvests out of that. So per year, you suddenly have 60, 70 tons. That's all a big difference. We came then in, that's where it was, was my part in there, we tried to simulate these things, and we could. We need to look at the paper. Um, the experiments were not done to the full extent there, and some of them they had not done the CO2, and some of them didn't do the, the uh, full light and so on. So by doing this, you could go to a bit over 100 uh, uh, tons per hectare per, tons per hectare per land layer. And with, with adding, I think there's some actually explanation in here, with sort of putting in the potential harvest index, which I'm not sure if you can get this, of 60%, you could produce in one layer uh, up to 180 tons per hectare, comparing to the 2.8, which is a bumper crop here, 180 tons. That's a huge amount. Um, if you do it, and a part of the paper, we had architects in there, we said, like, can you put us this up to 100 meters? Yeah, it's possible, but as higher you get, it becomes actually very expensive because you get a wind factor in there, so you have to all sorts of things. The building would cost a billion dollars there. I wanted to have a hectare, in, a hectare footprint in there. You could produce with 100 layers, the building would be about 120 meters high. It's not the highest, not the largest building in the world. You could produce 6,000 times the average yield in the field. That's a huge, it's a sort of game changer in terms of what you could produce. The other uh, cool thing in there, you don't need pesticides. So the expense we do, we don't do anything because there's no soil, which usually brings the pesticides in there. If you're a bit careful, you don't bring anything in there. Uh, there are no pesticides in there. Uh, you have no fertilizer loss. 
So you, you keep it in there. It's part of your solution. You don't lose anything. And it's a, I showed you before the issues we have with fertilizer loss. Um, and we lose less water. If you capture all the water, and I, some of the colleagues working with strawberries, they actually are able to capture a lot of the water. It's really just the water you take out with your grain. You remember the 1,500 liters per kilogram you need for irrigation? You're down to 0.1 liter uh, per kilogram. So a huge game changer, particularly interesting for areas where you just don't have water. This amount of water you can truck into a desert to grow wheat if you want, and if you have the energy. But there's always a but, so there are a lot of plus. There are actually almost only positive sides. But, uh, uh, sorry, actually, uh, up there. You see the red one in there, it uses enormous amounts of energy. The wheat you produce in there, if you do it full cargo, you couldn't pay the, for the bread in there. Uh, the quality, we don't even know. Of course, you push the system, we don't really know if you can even do bread out of it. Um, so commercially, the way we think commercial things work, you wouldn't do it. Uh, but I want to s give you a few uh, thoughts on the way as well, because we do a lot of things which don't really make sense or, or uh, also not uh, efficient uh, in the first place. If you just think about agriculture as a general one, there are more than $500 billion going agriculture. Now there's less, there's no, no direct uh, subsidies, let's maybe say it this way, in Australia, but there are 500 million 500 billion dollars going into subsidies every year. So it means, in general, globally, agriculture is not efficient on, it, on its own. So you be subsidizing what we, what, we, what we buy in there. Uh, we are not taking, we are not accounting in all the pollution. Someone will have to clean up the soil, the waterways, uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico I showed, uh, showed to you. It will be probably our kids, our grandchildren. There will be a huge cost. We are not paying for that. There's a huge cost which is not in there and what, what we currently, currently pay for. Um, then there is, uh, for many countries, it's food security is almost like uh, national security. It, it's very important to be independent because it has <coughs> been used as a weapon, it has been just recently <coughs> used as a weapon again, holding back exports of wheat in, in, in Ukraine, for instance. Um, and if you're worried about the energy, I'm not sure how many people sort of gamble with, with bitcoins. Bitcoins um, use, uh, and I think in 2022, used half a percent of all the energy in the world. It's like the entire energy use of the Netherlands is going into bitcoins, which are, has a bit in there, but are hard, it's hard to eat this stuff. So we're doing crazy things. You could see it further. You could think about um, military. Just another number from the US, I think. When I left there, the US spends $700 billion a year on the army, on military. Can you eat any of that? And you do it for a certain reason. So I just want to tell you, yes, it's crazy to do it, the economics are not right, but we do a lot of things which, when you really think about, they're also crazy. But in the end, what we do here, you could at least eat or feed people. Um, with that, uh, so the subsidies themselves, if you just take the subsidies out of agriculture and thinking forward in uh, people eating 70 kilograms a person, you could uh, feed another 700 million people. That's a lot, just based on the subsidies, just to give yourself a relationship with this. So, um, I think among others, and we haven't talked about as the other things, vertical farming could be a potential game changer, has no contribution whatsoever to food at the moment, maybe in 20, 30 years. When we wrote the paper a few years ago, so also nobody would be interested. I know two commercial entities which approached me and wanted to know how to grow wheat in there. So they must have some plants because they want to make money and want to do wheat in there, which is, which is interesting. Um, summarizing this all, the last few minutes, uh, just one more slide. Um, I, I spent a bit of time and I rushed through. I hope it was clear. We do need more food. We need more healthy food. But the way we, we continue, it has to be with less environmental impact. It's, it's not sustainable we do it. And despite of climate change. And climate change will cause a lot of problems. Um, I think we are actually in a, in a sort of exciting time in terms of science and research. I think there's a technology revolution going on and, and, and the way food might be produced in the next 10 to 20 years might be very different, or at least some parts. I don't think any of these technology, even the others we didn't talk, will replace all agriculture, but it could be part of agriculture. It could take some pressure off in some countries. It could allow to do agriculture where you can't do it. 
seeking, for instance, in Egypt, so North, and North Africa, and so on. Um, with these technologies, I think, with these new technologies, I think there's a huge opportunity for uh, society to produce very healthy, nutritional food. I didn't actually mention this. You, by being able to control everything, you probably have also potential to produce things which you never be able in the field. In the field, it depends on how your season finishes, of how your crop is growing. In there, if it needs more, a little bit of dryness or needs more certain spectrum of your light, you could give that to the crop. And you might be able to get a quality which you never achieve in the field. I didn't, didn't say that before. And it could be extremely environmental friendly. You go from whatever we do now, stopping pollution, uh, stopping, uh, uh, taking pressure off of 6,000 times the land you saw and lock up with a, with a building. That's why it's not just in this area. In other areas where you, where you want to take the pressure off, you build, build some of these sort of facilities and, and take the pressure off the way we currently produce food and maybe in some parts of, of Europe. Um, it looks like everyone plays a role, but I think the universities play, play a big role. It's a different way of doing it. So when I do public talk, I get often the question, can we actually eat it? Is it safe? And so on. Uh, but there's still a lot of things we need to research. We don't, a lot of things we don't know. We do not know the limits of growth. We don't know how far you can push a yield. We do not, don't know if the things, when we get the highest yields with research that we have, if you can eat these things, if you can do bread out of it or protein or whatever you want to do with this. So there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, questions there, a lot of research questions. What we know, there is a potential there. And I think, and I put this, this is my last part in here, um, and that goes back to the earlier ones, is we living a lifestyle, we, uh, we have a food in there, we, we, aff we are affording a food which we actually can't afford because we're not paying the real price for it. At the same time, the way we produce it, we're not taking, about, taking care of the environment, and someone will have to pay for it. How, how you make this working, different question, if you just increase the food price, there are people just living on a dollar or a dollar fifty, they can't afford any more. So it's not that easy. Well, many of these things are not that easy, but I think we really need to think about uh, what we eat, how we eat it, how we produce, and what we actually pay for it. With that, here's my email. You haven't thrown anything against, uh, towards me, so that's good. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your session. Thank you. We got some uh, 10 minutes for um, sharp questions. And just briefly say where you are from and ask uh, sharp questions. Don't give us a commentary. There's one from there behind. Don't give it to Hiro Python. Yeah, no, 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 no. Hiro is Hiro. not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful. Uh, can everyone hear me? So I'm a financier, so I apologize. But just suppose a, a government wanted to spend $100 million on doing what you want it to do. Just as a thought experiment, and I'm not expecting you, just, just, just the general answer to the question from you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the government would want to know what the likely effects of its spending would be. Suppose they knew the areas they wanted to spend it in, including the areas you're pointing out, but obviously not the companies in advance. How would you suggest they go about forecasting what that $100 million would actually be able to achieve in order to justify the expenditure? Sorry for the mm -hmm. hardball. No, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, I thought I answered it because we calculated that. So I can tell you what you get for your money you spend. So the building I showed you, it's actually a billion dollar um, system and it, it will produce you when we get to the potential so there's some theory still in there you could just go with the experimental one which has been proven and you get either 100 you get either 10,000 tons per hectare if you have 100 layers or you get um, 18,000 uh, tons per hectare so you, you know what you get you can you, you know we calculated how much energy you know you need for that so you know your bill but we also showed you, you get a lot of things which we don't, currently don't have a price on. The irrigation going on in the world, hardly anyone pays for the water they use. Um, the damage we do to the environment across the globe through agriculture, there's no price on it. Put a price on it and we could recalculate that of, of how much you, you make uh, out of it. What we did uh, so far, we compared it with the current system. And I tried to point out the current system is not properly priced. We're we, we eating things 
which someone else will get the bill, which is our kids and our grandchildren. Yeah. Another question here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas Allen from Marsha Innovations. Uh, what I'd like to know as well, has there been any um, developments in the MENA region of the world in regard to climate change and the effect on agriculture? In which regions? In the MENA, MENA region, yeah, yeah. MENA. Yeah. So I've worked quite a bit in, uh, in Egypt, and we did a lot of simulations there on climate change. For the simulation, it's actually quite easy because they're doing very well there. They get an, an, on a country level, they're getting six tons there, which is close to what you get in Europe. But they're in the desert, so they, they're managing things very well. And it's really driven by temperature. And we could, we could show already, in, I think in 2010, they had a bit of a blob in the temperature, and the, the country production goes down and, just because of temperature. And plenty of water from Nile. And, and plenty of water, it's very limited water. They yeah. are, they're, they're constrained by the water. They are so desperate because half of the wheat in Egypt is imported. They are so desperate, they're going now away from the Nile, they're pumping from groundwater, which they now only last 20 years, maybe 30 years. It's a limited resource, and they're speculating that uh, desalination will get so cheap that eventually they can irrigate this desalination. Mm. So they're very desperate. They're very desperate uh, because of another thing. So already the, the Egypt is the biggest wheat importer in the world. They have 100 million people living in Egypt. If they continue with the current growth rates, there will be 300 million by the end of the century. They have no way to supply enough food. There's no way to do it. So, um, I heard there's a rise of uh, biotechnology use, like CRISPR and like some sort of genetic engineering technologies. Like, what are you, what's your, what's your, what are your thoughts on the um, increase in biotechnology biotechno use on agriculture? Yeah. Well, it wasn't my talk about, but I see a lot of potential to rethink how the crops look like in there. Because in the field, I think maybe some of your colleagues can correct me, half of the efforts go into uh, breeding for disease resistance. If you don't have that, you can pull this back, and the energy which is used to maybe build this resistance, you don't need, in theory. Um, the way the crops look, so the only thing the, the, the NASA did, they were interested in the height, so they bought the height back, that's an easy thing, but it might not be the right way the crop is looking. You might, have, you might need other ways of uh, how the crop should do things, how you actually, you might not need the stem in there anymore. It might be just leaves and, and the ear coming out with, with heaps of ears. There are examples uh, in breeding where I recently saw one, you have an ear which has three parts of it, like branching out, doesn't work at all in, in, in the field, but some of the things which don't work in the field might become interesting there. And some of that you could maybe speed up mm. with, with some of the biotechnology in the parts of the world where you can do these things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, David? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of very similar question to that where you're moving You've got a, a revolution in taking agriculture, which for a thousand of years has been outdoors, taking it indoors, but the crops you're growing are, are, are very much the same crops that have been grown yeah. for thousands of years. So you're talking about having wheat being shorter, maybe fewer leaves, but if the outcome of what you want is, is essentially starch that you can make bread with, could you even look to, to go down the route of having microbes? Yeah. Uh, could agriculture look very different in terms of having these sort of crops. I sent you the paper, the other one, which had all these other things in there, of course, I mean, like in, in, um, in Singapore with a bigger project, that's just one part of it, growing it through a crop. The advantage is you can use it as it is. Through so algaes, for instance, uh, there's still quite a bit of processing, which obviously takes a lot of energy, and growing algaes is actually also quite expensive because you need a lot of light. The light penetration is a problem there. Often it just goes a centimeter or two. So you use a lot of light in there and still have to do the processing. Uh, in, in Singapore, other things people look at, it's, it's using flies, the, the uh, black soldier fly, to use out of the, out of the larvae, the protein. It's a moment just for feed. So the different things. And fermentation, another way uh, to produce the components you want. And for many things, that might be all we need. Yeah. And it's part of the mix. So the indoor is just one. If part of the mix in the future, I think these other technologies will play also a role. They won't replace everything, but they probably play yeah. a role. So I'll take on two more questions, one from um, Ross and then other from there. Yeah. Okay. Senthal, thanks yes, for your talk. I think another advantage of your new technology, and you're probably aware of this, but the free on board price for wheat, 30 to 40% of that is the supply chain cost. That is, it's the cost of getting the grain from the farm onto the ship. 
the advantage of your system is that you can grow the wheat actually closer Close. to the consumer, exactly. and that's an added advantage yeah. of that system. Yeah, definitely. And also, particularly for coming back for wheat, a lot of wheat is shipped around the world. I think mm. we um, trading 140, 150 140 million, uh, million uh, tons, uh, yeah. tons a year, so they get shipped around long distances, of course. Yeah. Yes. Last question. Uh, thanks. Uh, Doug Hall, I work for industry against uh, regulation, I guess, more regulation. So I guess in relative terms, from my experience, the technology, and it sounds a little flippant, is the easy bit. The hard bit is the economics where it's viable, and you've touched on that. But the governance and society, by governance, I assume you're, that includes re regulatory barriers, because the regulatory barriers to a lot of those technologies you had up there are huge. And that's linked to society's preparedness mm. to accept the technologies and also accept the preparedness to pay, which you also touched on. Mm. So I wonder, if, have you done any work on that regulatory barrier area? I, I haven't. I'm a scientist, so I'm not interested mm -hmm. in the barriers. <laughs> Um, but I, I talk to the industry quite a lot, and, and the one company which thought they are close to sort of making a profit, and they, they change the way they sort of the way they do it, it seems to be not a problem because you actually produce very clean uh, produce there, and very fresh. So it works very well with, with salads and on, on all sorts of leafy greens because um, and eventually. You can show that there's nothing in there. You don't have all these diseases and microtoxins and so on. And you can taste it. You can feel it. I've eaten these things. They are just absolutely fresh. Um, nobody is doing any of the sort of the normal feed crops in there commercially. I don't know why there should be barriers there if they do it with sort of things which are more sensitive, like, like um, uh, leafy greens and, and have colleagues which are working on strawberries. I don't think there are barriers in, in, in Europe for that, which would be the first place where you Well, I think the, this. I mean, I would totally agree with you. I mean, the, the, the opportunity we've got here is that we can design fast because we've got yeah. technology, yeah. molecular biology, genetics, and so forth. So touching on the use of molecular biology. Um, but to tailor crops to optimally m manufacture them in these new facilities, you're going to have to convince society that engineered crops sure. are acceptable to it. Yeah. Thank I you. agree on this, but I, what I try to show is without biotechnology, yeah, you have already a yield which yeah. is 6,000 times higher. We, we, biotechnology we, gives you maybe another yeah. 50. We can have further discussion at the drinks. Sir. <laughs> so, so I would like to thank you to join me in thanking Senthol for this interesting and challenging talk. You know, some of the technology may not be immediately applicable to wheat, but certainly other leafy vegetables and and uh, and and, and other fruit crops like uh, tomato and so on. So please thank me. I would like to especially acknowledge uh, adjunct Professor Neil Turner, who really worked hard to bring Santol here and convince us that it is worth uh, having his lecture today. I think it is uh, really worth. So thank you, Neil, for that. Now, I just want to uh, bring some lectures uh, before closing this, that the Institute has a number of fantastic events coming very soon. Um, please save the dates, uh, as we will be sending out invitations to register shortly. So on April 11th, we will host a lecture on food security in China, delivered by Professor Peter Verghese. Uh, he's from um, Peter Verghese Manalu from University of Alberta. Uh, then we also have the seven outstanding UWA PhD candidates. They will present their research achievements at our annual postgraduate showcase on 31st of May. And this is our 17th or 18th uh, such uh, event. Then we will have industry forum, which will be held on 19th July on the topic, paving the way for the next generation of WA agriculture. Again, a very uh, interesting topic. We are trying to uh, really come up with some keynote speakers and others because we need to know what next, as Senthol just showed, you know, we produce 26 million tons, we may produce 30 million tons, what is beyond, what, where, who, is, who is going to support that, how we got the manpower, uh, and so on. So that will be interesting. And please scan the QR code on the screen to follow us, the even tribe, and ensure that uh, you will never miss this opportunity. Once again, I thank also my colleagues and, uh, and uh, Rosanna and others from the Institute for organizing this. So, but I look forward to continuing the conversation uh, on the drinks, which will be at the um, Bailey's Lecture Theatre. Thank you.
Hvala.